Hi, everyone. Welcome to another presentation. Um, again, I like to do these. I actually do them in my home to practice for when I'm presenting for our youth group or um, young adult Vesper sessions. And so some of what I say might be for a live audience, but you can take this video and use it for your youth group sessions if you would like. Um, and hopefully one way or the other, even if you're just using it privately in your home, you find it inspiring and helpful to you. So let me pull up my slides and then we will get started. Yeah, here we go. So before we start, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, I just ask that you will give us wisdom as we look at nature and the beautiful things you've created, as we look at gardening and the lessons we can learn from it. Give us your wisdom as we talk together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so my presentation is on object lessons from gardening. I don't know about any of you, but I have fallen in love with gardening. My mom is so impressed with me because when I was younger, I used to hate it. And I, we would work in the garden together and I would help her. And I was always like, I don't like gardening. I'm never going to garden well. Here I am. And I've got my own garden and I love it. So this is going to be an interactive brainstorming ses session. So I'm not just going to be giving you all the information. I want you to actively participate. So get yourselves ready, maybe get some paper, pencils, um, and hopefully you have more than one person there that you can brainstorm with. So let's get started. Why are we doing this? I really like this quote from Child Guidance, Ellen White. She says, from the tilling of the soil, lessons may constantly be learned. No one settles upon a raw piece of land with the expectation that it will at once yield a harvest. Diligent, persevering labor must be put forth in the preparation of the soil, the sowing of the seed, and the culture of the crop. So it must be in the spiritual sowing. The garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by repentance. The evil growths that choke the good grain must be uprooted. As soil once overgrown with thorns can be reclaimed by diligent labor, so the evil tendencies of the heart can be overcome by the earnest effort in the name and strength of Christ. So as you can see, we can learn so much from working in our gardens, from being out in nature. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the life God has given us. He doesn't want us to just always be reading our Bibles and praying and studying. Those are good things, but we have to go out and live our lives. But if we can find little ways all throughout our day, whether we're working in the garden or doing dishes or just the mundane tasks of life, if we can find little ways within those to see what lessons he might be teaching us, what object lessons we can find, that can help us always to keep putting our thoughts back on him all throughout the day and maintaining that connection with him. So that's why we're doing this session today. I want us to really put our minds on what things can we learn when we're out in our gardens? What things can God teach us there about our own lives? So this is how this is gonna work. I'm gonna be going through and sharing about nine or so observations that I've noticed in my own gardening experiences. Once I share an observation, I want you to break into groups of three to four people if you have enough people there. And um, just if you're watching a vi this video, you're going to pause the video so that you can do your brainstorming. So after I share the observation, I'm not going to share the object lesson. I want you guys to actively participate. Think of what object lessons you think come from that observation. Maybe take about three minutes or so. Be creative. Be specific. There's no right or wrong answers. Each observation could have multiple object lessons that come from it. So see what your each of your groups comes up with, and then you can share. And then I will be sharing my thoughts after that or some Bible verses and, and things that we can apply to the observation. So you guys ready? Let's do number one, soil. So I moved to my current house about a year and a half ago, I think. And when I first moved here, I tried to put my garden directly into the ground soil. And I found out very quickly that I have clay soil and it was extremely hard to grow stuff in it. So that was my first year of gardening. My second year of gardening, gardening I said, I have to do something with this soil. I can't keep gardening in it as is. It was rocky, full of roots and weeds and clay and ugh, it was awful. So what I had to do is I had to add in a bunch of other things. I had to layer up the fall before 
um, and they had to sit over winter. I had to layer up, I think I did cardboard, um, black dirt that I hauled in from somewhere else, um, grass clippings, leaves, manure, wood chips, and I don't even remember what else, but a whole bunch of layers of different types of um, organic materials. And what I learned is that um, come spring, all I did in the spring was I added one more layer of black dirt on top and my soil was the softest, fluffiest, moistest soil I've ever seen. It was amazing to grow in and it barely had any weeds growing in it. Um, it's just been a dream to work in. So good soil has to have variety in it. And you can turn almost any poor soil into good soil simply by adding a variety of organic matter. Manure, leaves, grass clippings, all of those things. Compost, that's another thing I put in mine. Um, what you'll find is that clay soil will get balanced and softened and like sandy soil will get enriched and darkened. And then the other thing that's important is not to um, strip a soil out by just planting and planting the same crop over and over again in it. Um, it's so good to do crop rotation. If you plant tomatoes in one spot one year, switch them out and plant something else there the next year and so on and rotate your crops around. Otherwise your soil just gets so depleted. So now it's your turn. What might the object's lessons from this be? So now is your chance to pause the video, take maybe about three minutes in your groups or on your own and just think about what do you think that might be the object lesson of this? What might the soil represent? What might the variety put into it represent? All right, pause your video. Okay, now I'm going to share with you what I was thinking of as I did this. And again, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, there can be multiple object lessons from the same thing. So here's, here are my thoughts. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So if we think of the soil being our, like our hearts or our minds, you could think, you know, our, how many of you have ever found yourselves or seen other people who just have become fixated or stuck in one thought pattern or one activity pattern. And that's all they do. That's all they spend their free time on. Some people, for some people, it might be video games. Hopefully I'm not stepping on any toes there, but you know how, or it might be movies. That's all you do in your free time. You just like maybe scrolling Facebook, I'm talking to myself here. Um, there's, there's these things that we get just stuck in and our lives become imbalanced. We need to feed our, the soil of our hearts or our minds good things. We can become stagnant and fixated in our thinking and not enjoy that abundance and that richness that God wants to put before us through his word, through songs, through um, talking with others, through going to church, through going to prayer meetings. We need this variety in our lives. We need to study multiple Bible topics. Sometimes we're, we might be studying the Bible, but you might be fixated on just one thing, and that's all you study about, and it's become your whole life, and that's all you want to talk about and share about. That can be good, but it can also deplete you of the, like, the richness and variety that God wants you to have in your life. So number two, seeds. I find seeds fascinating because it's just amazing what God does. You take one little seed, you put it in the ground, and you get so much in return. So for example, cucumbers, that's like my favorite vegetable or fruit, whichever camp you're in. One single cucumber seed will grow into a plant that produces around 10 cucumbers. I looked this up and I found the math on it. So each cucumber, one from one seed is going to come a plant that has about 10 cucumbers on it. Now, each of those cucumbers is going to have around 100 seeds in it. So that means that from one cucumber seed comes the potential for a thousand more plants. Each one of those seeds, so that's about a thousand seeds from one seed, each of those seeds having the potential for a thousand more, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's fascinating to me. God is amazing. Um, but before I go into what I, my thoughts on this, I want to know, I want you to think about what might the object lessons from this be? There could be more than one. So go ahead and pause the video and see what you come up with. Okay. 
Here's what I was thinking. The Bible says that the seed is the word of God, Luke 8, verse 11. It also says, and the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted, Mark 4, verse 20. We might never know until heaven the number of souls won for God's kingdom simply by just putting one seed of truth into their lives. You might not even know you did it simply by living out who you are in Christ. You can be planting seeds and not even know what great harvest might come of it. I heard a story recently, a true story, a mission story about a woman who, or a family who went overseas to be missionaries. And it turns out the, the mother got sick and she ended up dying. And the father left the faith and the child was uh, given to ra be raised by other missionary families. And you would think, oh, they failed as missionaries. They failed. But what happened was that mother, she was just staying at home with her child as a missionary mom. But every day, I think it was a little boy from the village who would come and bring either her groceries or her milk or something. Every day, she would just speak a kind word to him. And then, she, you know, she died and the family left and you would think everything failed. But that one little boy, those just kind words that this missionary woman spoke to him, caused him to want to become a, a Christian, a follower of Christ. And he started going to the school that was a couple hours away, in a, like a, in Adventist school. And eventually he became a missionary to his people in that same village. And the whole village was one to God. Just because of that one woman. And it looked like a failure, but God used it and brought a hundredfold from it, from those little seeds. So never underestimate what a kind word can do, what a smile can do, what sharing a Bible verse can do with someone. You never know, even just leaving a tract somewhere, what the result of that might be. Object lesson number three or um, observation number three, my gardening observation. Weeds. How many of you like pulling weeds? My mom actually does. I don't particularly, although it can be it can be kind of relaxing sometimes. But I've noticed something interesting, and that is that it's easier to pull weeds if it has rained. Especially in the dry weather, those weeds just do not want to come out of the ground. If the soil's dry, they tend to just break off, they regrow, and you're constantly dealing with those weeds. After rain, it's always easier for those, they just come right out of the ground. Soil becomes softer, it becomes more aerated, it's easier to work with. So now, here's your turn. What do you think the object lessons of this might be? Go ahead and pause the video. Okay, I was thinking about this and it made me think about the Holy Spirit and the latter rain. It says in Luke 1 verse 17 that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Now, this was specifically talking about the Elijah come, um, but it was talking about how he had the spirit of God in him um, and how like the latter rain represents the spirit of God and how it works in people's lives. So if we're going around just trying to yank weeds out of our hard hearts on our own, we're going to have a hard time of it. But if we allow the rain of the Holy Spirit to water our hearts and the rain, like the living water from God's word to soften our hearts, it's going to make that work of plucking out sin and bad habits so much easier. Object lesson number four, mulching. So like I said, I don't like weeding. So I have found a way to not have to weed. I planted my garden this spring and then I did something to it and I went away to Europe for a whole month. I came back and I had basically no weeds in my garden. It was amazing. I've done this for a few years now and I highly recommend it. If you mulch, mulching is laying down either grass clippings, leaves, the straw you can use, multiple things. My favorite is grass clippings because they tend to work, they work the best, they're the softest, easiest to work with, and they usually don't grow back. Straw will often grow weeds out of it because it has like straw seeds or hay seeds in it, but, um, or wheat seeds, whatever is in straw. Anyway, grass clippings work best for me. Um, 
and you'll find you have very few to little no to no weeds when you mulch. If you don't mulch, any open soil is almost sure to just produce weeds after weeds and you'll pull them out and there'll be more weeds and then you pull them out and you hoe and you rake and you do all these things over and over and over again. On the other hand, if you put down a thick layer of mulch, it keeps the weeds away. Not only that, it helps hold moisture in the soil. It helps support the plants. They kind of rest on it, it helps keep them up. Um, I found you don't actually, you actually don't have to hill potatoes. If you pack around them like grass or hay or straw um, really high up around them, it's kind of like a artificial little bed for them or hill it for them to grow the potatoes in. So mulching has a lot of benefits. What might this apply to our everyday lives, our spiritual lives? Take a moment, pause the video and see what you can come up with. All right, I was thinking about this and it reminded me of the parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 12. And he talks about this man who had an evil spirit and he gets rid of him and he cleans up his house. But then the evil spirit says, I'll return to the person I came from. So it returns and it finds its former home empty, swept and in order. And then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself and they all enter the person and live there. And so the person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. My thought was, you know, we could spend our whole lives doing weed control, quote unquote, trying to just get rid of weeds out of our, our sins, our bad habits, trying to constantly pull them out. Oh, there's more. Okay, got to pull those ones out. More and more always follow. Or instead, we could leave that work with God and we could instead focus on filling that void with a loving relationship with Jesus, laying down that foundation, that cover over our lives, instead of just constantly taking out, what are we putting back in? What are we filling our lives with? Do you have that foundation with God in your life? Do you have daily um, investments into your walk with him? Um, or are you just constantly focusing on trying to fix yourself? Number five, thinning. This is kind of along the same lines as weeding and everything else, but I found that if you have weeds or other plants that are crowded too close together, it can actually end up sapping the nutrients from the plant and causing it to not produce as high a quality of harvest. So it's actually good to prune and thin your plants. You can see the pictures, so the plant, the kale plants on the right, um, if you look closely, they're growing really close together. And often they, they grow really well that way, but you can see they have pretty thin, small stems. They're not gonna grow as big. Apple trees, if anybody's ever had apple trees, you know that um, pruned apple trees, if you don't prune them, they're probably gonna have a lot of apples. So pruning them is gonna reduce the number of apples, but it's also going to improve the quality of the apples. So you'll have fewer, but they will be better. But I found this weird phenomenon Thinning the plants sometimes causes them to fail. I actually did this with my kale this year. They'd grown up pretty large and it was really crowded together. So I thinned out a number, quite a few of the plants. Thinned out a lot of the plants and gave them space so they could grow and each plant could get bigger and healthier. I came back the next day and oh no, my kale plants were withering up and turning brown and drying out. I was like, and they were falling over. They weren't standing up straight. I was like, oh no, what happened? I, here I removed the very things that were sapping the nutrients from the plant, and instead of thriving, they're withering away. So I have a thought on this, but I want you to think, what could the object lessons from this be? Pause the video. All right. The Bible says, on the day, on Judgment Day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. And John 17 verse 3 says, this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. My thought is that God wants us to have our own relationship with him. How many of you are just surviving because you go to church and your friends are there? 
or you or believe what you believe because that's what your parents always believed and you just picked it up from them. If all of that was stripped away and removed, would you still be able to stand? If your family left the faith, would you still stand? If your friends decided to leave the church, would you still be rooted and grounded or would you wither away and die? You have to have your own personal relationship with God and you have to be grounded and rooted in his word for yourself. You have to know why you believe what you believe and where it comes from in God's word. You can't rely even on your church for your spiritual walk with God. We have to have our own walk with him. We have to know him for ourselves. Or even if we're doing miracles in his name and prophesying, we're, Lord, Lord, I was the church board leader and I was the deaconess or an elder. None of that matters if he doesn't know us and we don't know him. Number six, companion planting. This is something I discovered this year, actually, for my garden, and I started doing it. So what I learned is that there are some plants, you know how most people, we grow our gardens in like rows and we just do this whole row is kale and this whole row is tomatoes and this, or sections even, you know, this section is this and that, and we kind of compartmentalize them all together. What I learned is that there are some plants, for example, marigold flowers and leafy greens that will naturally help each other out. So marigolds are a natural pest repellent. If you plant them in amongst your um, kale or collards or other leafy greens, you are much less likely to have the worms and the, the moths that come and eat your plants. Another example might be um, corn and beans. Beans like to climb up the corn. Sunflowers and beets. I've learned this year that sunflowers help to shade the really beet plants are quite... Um, what's the word they're like tender and very delicate and the the sunflower plants help to shade them and just are a really good companion for them planting some flowers among your vegetables can attract birds who eat bugs so this is kind of the balance out to the last object lesson but pause the video and see what you think what object lessons might be here for us are you ready for my thoughts the bible says as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Proverbs 17, 17. Two people are better off than one. I love this verse. This is so beautiful. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So yes, we talked about in the last example that we need to be able to stand alone, but we also need each other. Where one person is weak, another may be strong. I just want to encourage you to come alongside each other. Come alongside your brothers and sisters in the church, no matter their weaknesses or deficiencies. Come alongside each other in our Christian walks and be those helpful companion plants. Number seven, suckers. I'm not talking about you guys. Okay. I love pruning suckers off my tomato plants. I think it's so satisfying. You can look on the pictures. This is what I came back to after I went on my trip to Europe. My school garden was just completely overgrown, the tomato plants. And so I had to go in and, and completely prune those out. So I came at it probably way too late. But still, it was a lot of fun to just see it come down and get back to where it was supposed to be. So as you can see on the top picture, a plant with suckers, or suckers is going to produce a lot. Some of those sucker plants that I pruned off had more tomatoes on them than the entire plant put together. But the problem is that the suckers, they might produce a lot but it's gonna be a lesser quality. It's again, gonna sap those nutrients and they won't be as flavorful. Sucker is gonna push away. So wait, I wish I could show you an actual plant with a sucker. So you'll have the plant here and you'll have a leaf growing out here. So here's the stem of the plant and here's the leaf. And right in between there comes out the sucker plant. It comes out, growing out just like this out of the plant. So you can see that there. And what happens is it starts to push it. It grows pretty big and it starts to push away that leaf. Pretty soon that leaf withers and dies. It breaks off and there's this big sucker plant growing out there. So the job of the leaf is to produce photosynthesis, is to add those nutrients to the plant. 
and it ends up pushing away those leaves and just growing more tomatoes and I like to think of it that it, it it's almost like the sucker is trying to do the main part of the plant in producing tomatoes. It's like, I can do a better job than you. I'm going to grow more than you do. Pruning the plant allows for growth and nutrients to return to the original stem and the fruits, making them bigger and more flavorful. So what do you think the object lessons might be? Get those wheels of your mind turning. Pause the video, see what you can come up with. Ready for me to share? Hopefully you've already shared yours. And I'm gonna share what I was thinking. The Bible says, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Rather than competing to be everything all by yourself, I'm going to take over the church and I'm going to make sure to fix all its errors. And don't compete with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Instead, use the unique gifts and talents that God has given you, however small. Maybe your job is to be a leaf and support that main plant. Maybe your job is to grow fruit. Support that body of Christ as a whole. Number eight, training plants. So my tomato plants, back to those. I came back from Europe and I they, they were all overgrown. They were intermixed, stems were going everywhere. You might be able to see it in the top right picture, but that is one crooked stem. It's going from the right and then directly back to the left again. They were kind of all over the place. If I had gotten to them right away in the, when they were little and I had staked them, but I couldn't, I was gone overseas. So um, it would have been ideal if I could have done that because then they would have grown really straight and true. Instead, they, they're all kind of going like this, but I did stake them now and now they're growing straight from now on. There's a lot of crooked parts on those plants. It's very interesting though, how much you can get plants to grow a certain way based on what you have around them. You can get squash and cucumber plants to grow where you want them. You just kind of start training them a certain direction. Um, cucumbers have those little tendrils uh, or spirals that come off of them and you wrap them around a stake or something and then they'll start growing that direction. Uh, but it's like I said, it's best to start when the plant is very small. If you put a stake next to a tomato plant, it's going to grow really straight and true. If you don't, like I made the mistake, it's going to be crooked. And I, I don't know if you know this, but celery that you buy in the store doesn't just grow that way naturally. They've actually put a box around it, like you can see in the bottom picture, that helps it to grow up really long and skinny at first and then be leafy at the top. So the, some plants will just grow into the shape they fit to fit inside of a shape that's around them. Some people, I don't know if you've, you can probably look this up online. Some people have actually grown like square watermelons by putting a box around them. Um, my cabbage is in my garden. I have a fence around my garden. And in one place I have cabbage plants in the corner of the fence and they're growing up kind of in the, like a square shape and um, along the edges of the fence because that's the box that's around them where they're able to grow. So take a, take a moment, we're gonna pause the video, take a few minutes. What do you think the object lessons might be? All right, hopefully you've unpaused the video because you're watching this. Here's what I was thinking. The Bible says, direct your children onto the right path and when they are older, they will not leave it. Our surroundings are very important. Now this is talking about children and it can definitely apply to children, but maybe you're not a child anymore. You're an older young person or you're an older person and, and you're like, well, my life is already going this way. You can still have that environment or put yourself in those surroundings that are gonna influence you the way that you want to grow. Surround your children or yourself with the kind of environment and influences that you want them or yourself to be like, and they will follow that pattern. Think about that in your own life. What are the surroundings that you have? In what way are your surroundings shaping you? Ask God to show you what you might need to change in your life. Last one, harvest. 
harvest is definitely one of the most rewarding parts of gardening. What I found though, is that harvest doesn't happen all at once. Now I know it feels like it. You come to the end of the summer and it's like, oh my, everything's coming all at once in the garden. But a lot of times that's because we don't keep up with it. And now suddenly we're like, oh, I've got to pick tomatoes and green beans and I've got to do up the zucchini and everything's happening at once. But if you do keep up with it, most things you're gonna find that it's a little bit of green beans here and a little bit of kale there. And then a few more tomatoes. And then you go back the next day and there's a few more. It's little by little that you are bringing in this harvest. So let's take a moment. I want you to pause and think what might the object lessons of this be? All right. I wish I could hear your sharing thoughts, but hopefully you have somebody you can there that you can share them with. The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. And then also Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We need that daily work in the heart. Our characters are not going to be transformed or formed all in one day, all at once. It has to be little advances, little harvests, little fruit here and there, and never giving up. Be reflective each day. Bring your heart to God. Say, what, are, what harvest do you want me to have today? What harvest are you doing in me today? Um, ask him what he wants to grow in your heart and what he sees growing there. Continue working with him because we can claim this promise. He's not going to give up on us. Whatever good work he has begun in you, and he's begun a good work in each and every one of us, he is going to complete that until the day that he comes back again, which will be very soon. So let's close with prayer, and I hope this was a blessing to you. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day and for all of the wonderful things you've given us. Thank you for the ability to garden. I, I pray that each one of us will be able to get out in nature in some way, whether we're just going for walks or whether we're growing little things on apartment um, decks or something like that. I pray that each one of us will have this opportunity to interact with nature and the plants that you've given us and to learn these lessons and look for them in our daily lives so that we can always have our minds on you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.